So, shall we begin? Can you, yeah. Can you hear, can you hear us fine? It sounds like you can. We're, we're just thrilled that um, so many of you have decided to rest your feet and come here to hear us talk about um, the inspiration and collaboration that artists have found in the Glass House, the Philip Glass House in New Canaan, Connecticut. I wonder if we can close the door. Is that possible? Mm. <laughs> um, and this is, it's really a long, long co collaboration. Uh, it, art has always been at the center in many ways of the Glass House, although I think that many of you think of the Glass House as um, it, a, 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 a moment in aspic, uh, a, an architectural moment in aspic, but in actual fact, it's a reflection of two incredibly original people who loved art. Uh, Philip Johnson was buying Paul Clay from Paul Clay in Europe in the 1930s. He was the one that sent Joseph Albers down to Black Mountain to teach in 1948. Um, when he met David Whitney, which was in the 60s, he was 33 years older than the 21-year-old David Whitney, who was a student at the Rhode Island School of Design and had come to uh, hear Philip Johnson at Brown. And their first conversation was, um, uh, David Whitney went up to Philip Johnson and asked him about the Jasper Johns flag and then got himself invited to the Glass House for the weekend and basically never left. Um, and um, David Whitney had an incredible eye for contemporary art, which Johnson always said David introduced him to that. And together they made an extraordinary collection in part because Philip Johnson, who had been the founding director of the architecture department at the Museum of Modern Art, helped David get a job there in the curatorial departments. David went on to many, many curatorial exciting projects um, with Jasper Johns, Frank Stella, Andy Warhol, um, Cy Twombly. Uh, the, the collection included them, included de Kooning, went on up to the 80s with Eric Fischel and Julian Schnabel. And after they died, both of them, died in 2005, the house was willed to the um, Natural Trust for Historic Preservation and is open now um, for tours where you can not only see the glass house, but you can see the 13 other buildings on the 45 acre pro uh, property, including the two galleries that Philip Johnson designed, one for sculpture and one for painting. And it's very, very important to um, Rina Zorowski, now the interim director of the Glass House, and, and Hunter Palmer, um, who runs the programs, that this very personal engagement with art and with artists continue and grow, which is why today we are talking with two contemporary artists. We're talking with Todd Eberly, uh, who is a great photographer, and whose book um, has just come out. Um, uh, and I'm, I'm what, what is it? Empire of Space. Right there. It's right there, you guys, if you want to buy it. And uh, Liam Gillick, who is a conceptual artist who works in any number of fields and is represented in Miami right now in a collaboration he has done with Pringle of Scotland. But this is just one of the many things they do. So they, we, we just had a wonderful conversation in which they really started talking about artistic process. And one of the things I'm very interested in and that I, I actually want to start with, with Todd, with you, is the way in which the site and uh, the context of the art changes it. For instance, there is a 1971 concrete circle, a very unusual circle, um, by, uh, by, uh, by Judd, Donald Judd, which mirrors uh, from the 50s the circular lake at the entrance that, that Johnson built. And Todd, who really came to prominence with the photographs he took of Judd's work everywhere, um, has experienced that and photographed it. And, and I really wanted to ask you about the Judd and your experience with Judd and with the Johnson Judd. Uh, hmm. The Johnson Judd is an interesting, uh, has an interesting site. Do I sound right? Because it sounds strange to me, no? Yeah, can, you, can you understand no, us? Is it echoing? Yeah, it's pointing, the speakers are pointing oh, okay. that way. See. Sorry. Um, the, the, the site of the Judd is uh, at the entrance to the glass house. When you drive in, there's a little uh, pitch the driveway takes down, and then you see the glass house, and the, the, the Judd sits there. And it's in, uh, I think it was built in the late 60s, and I heard from Peter Ballantyne, Judd's uh, 
uh, one of Judd's oldest employees who built all of Judd's plywood pieces, that uh, Judd had traded Mr. Johnson a, a Frank Stella painting for that piece. And apparently Judd wrote something very nasty about Philip shortly thereafter, and um, I think it was always sort of bitterly, bitterly considered after that. <laughs> he did, and he got rid of, of one of Judd's pieces and, uh, as a result. Apparently he had a Judd stack at one time and in, in deaccession himself of that in, immediately after the scathing, whatever it was that Judd wrote. I wish I had the quote, but I'm sure it was precise and nasty. <laughs> So, because you have filmed Judd's everywhere, you have the, in all many, his, many all contexts. All in architecture, yeah. yeah so, how, how, what, how does this site change the work? How does it being in this site make it different? Actually, it seems oddly placed to me because so many of the, the, the glass house sits on, I think it's a 65 acre property. And this sits very awkwardly nestled between a tree and the driveway. And, and, and one would think that, why wasn't it given some prominent space place in the space of the, of the property. So for me, it's a very awkward, sort of illogical place for it to be somehow. And I don't know how, how it ended up there. So can you, I mean, when you photograph it, it's almost impossible to, to separate it from the house, right? Impossible, from the glass house. Yeah. Impossible. It, it, I mean, Judd, Judd's work generally sits in, you know, a, a, a situation where there's a large amount of space around it to focus the attention to that thing and, and or that that you know piece, but in this case, there's something feels there's something that feels awkward about it. And, but I don't know enough of the history about how it got there and why it was put there because Judd had to have had something to do with that. And and Liam, you've talked about how the glass house is such an iconic monument of. 20th century architecture, and that you turn your back on the glass house and look at other works by Johnson when you're working with the work and considering the work. <coughs> yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's difficult to talk about these kind of things, because if you look at the title of the talk today, it appears to be addressing the relationship between art and architecture, which is one of these classic sort of things that seem logical. It seems perfectly correct thing to do. But it's quite clear from looking at the placement of the Judd, for example, or even when you see the, this kind of uh, idiosyncratic but, but rather technically um, complex uh, a system for hanging paintings, right? There's that, maybe you can describe that, that there's a weird place where there's movable walls where you, you so have paintings hung on Hesse. It's like a, a carousel of moving walls. Right. And so the, the, the paintings are hung in such a way where in each of the three carousels, you can have a constantly rotating, permanently right. new way of combining painting. Yeah. But you so can never get enough distance to actually see them. That's exactly. one of the yes. problems. It's a very yeah. awkward prescribed space that he didn't put enough more, or, or, enough around it again. But it, so it, it means in that a way, it mimics the Judd problem. But it means it has a very specific resonance, this place, because like most artists, I'm interested in things other than art. So. Frankly, what I find fascinating about the relationship between the house and the work around it or within, within that context is it's full of like transgressive innovations that frankly, at the time that he did them, were completely against the prevailing mood of what you do with contemporary art, that they were absolutely against the way you were supposed to handle it or display it, even that, that, that somehow the art in, in the collection and, and around the house becomes another um, like test case or some kind of example of something that sits not naturally or logically in relation to each other. It becomes part of this kind of collage of ideas. And this is what I mean by turning my back on the house. It seems we, we, it's very clear that many artists, uh, especially today, uh, base a lot of their work on, on recuperation and, and reenactment and, and coming back to a site of maybe of high modernism to like examine it carefully. What I'm interested in is actually turning my back metaphorically on the house always. I can never look at it clearly. Um, and, and looking out as to, uh, to the two great kind of complicated issues about this kind of space, which are that for me it's really at this turning point that in a way it is the beginning of a, of a new model of kind of lifestyle, a new model of of, of, I mean, a progressive and good one, of a new type of, of way of living. 
and a new, new, new sense of how to configure uh, the relationship between humans and art and objects. And on the other hand, it also has this kind of universalizing potential, and it makes me kind of ache a little bit that I, I, I want the, this place and the values of it to be expanded. I want to see traces of it on a much broader scale. Do you see what I mean? So I tend to, we're almost opposite. Todd, in a way, is my eyes for the house. I can look at the house through Todd, but somehow I can't do it myself. And he looks in and I look out somehow. That's the way I look at it. In fact, Todd's images uh, on this loop that you're looking at, in fact, I want to talk about the, the, the one we just saw. But on this loop you're looking at, Todd's images start after we've looked at the collection as a collection. And though that's Todd's view of the house. And you're, it's so much has to do with detail, doesn't it? So much of how you look at things has to do with detail or framing in the environment. Also, uh, approaching a, a thing as iconic as, as, as the glass house that I grew up, you know, having this, it was my version of what, what, a, what the castle, what kids dream about castles and fairy tales. This was my fairy tale in a way. And it's interesting because Liam talks about looking away from it and I can't help but look at it. So in fact, we are opposite in a certain sense, but what, becomes challenging when you fo when when one is is presented with a super iconic thing it's very difficult to get around the images that you have preloaded from history in your mind and i was recently there <coughs> some of these photographs were taken this summer um, but one of the incredible things i saw and i wish i presented it as part of the show but it was a bit of a snapshot and it was blurry but i became fascinated by the shower head and the in the cylindrical volume of the of the house that has the fireplace on the outside and the bathroom on the inside. And there was a, a rotten, totally decayed uh, Speakman shower head that had lime caked all around the, the nozzles. And there was something to me kind of beautifully metaphoric about this one sort of decaying object in the otherwise somewhat pristine space. Well, that's a whole issue, isn't it, with legacy artist legacy spaces <laughs> such as Judd's um, Judd Chinati Foundation, Chinati Foundation and yeah. also the Judd Foundation. And I know, Leon, you've spoken about this whole legacy issue and the, and the, the balance between conservation, restoration, and how what age does. Or how far you go with it or how you address it. You know, there are many difficult problems. Well, it's, it's a, for me, it's like, it, it's definitely, ha an, it's, it's a, we could call it at least an ethical challenge because obviously it can seem not the most urgent thing to do, right? To, to somehow spend, expend a lot of time and effort to, to ensure that this place uh, uh, still can exist and still function in the world. Um, so, you know, with all the other things to d attend to and deal with, it, it can seem tricky. But because of the way that, that, that the, the structure itself and, and more the landscape itself and also what I think the place implies in terms of, like I said, a way of living and a way of existing, um, uh, it's crucial to keep it. it, it it's very self-consciously a testing environment where, where, where things are, I mean, if you look at this image right here, right now, that floating sort of uh, palisade type thing is actually related to a house that was built later in Dallas for a, for a, uh, I guess, a construction, a guy who had a big construction company. And you can see that that is an autonomous work. That no, it's an oil a, era. It's called Mrs. Was it? Beck. What a, yeah, exactly. Something like that. It's n anyhow, to <laughs> cut a long story short, the, you can see that there's this mixture of the placement and display of possession and ownership of certain things that signify an enlightened and develop consciousness. On the other hand, you can see that things are being tested. And you absolutely see a transition from a kind of high modernist kind of consensus to a sort of postmodern uh, um, celebration, but also crisis. And this is what has to be kept. And this is the thing that has to be maintained. Well, Philip, because Philip it's, it's a clear a story. Of the people he of the architects he elevated to fame, and then he yeah. would riff on them with some of these Yeah, but that's what, things. you know, if you go to grammar school in England and go to, you know, do the things I do, you call that super self-conscious postmodern awareness mm. instead of, like, what you called it. But they essentially <laughs> may be the same thing. 
and, and they have, they, they, this is the kind of thing you have to keep. And it's the most difficult thing to deal with because, of course, it seems to be very tempting to look at one component, say the glass house, which has this kind of uh, very strong meaning. You know, if you ask someone to draw you a modernist structure, they'll either draw you a tower or they'll draw you a horizontal. They'll either draw you something that's towered and you can't see what's going on, or it's flat and you can see everything that's going on. And this is the thing. This is the reason why it has to be kept somehow. But, you know, also the, the keeping of it does not have to be neurotic. And I think there's a tendency nowadays to try and think that contemporary art is the answer to kind of remake or reimagine re or re-engage everything. And I think the trick with the, the, the glass house is to um, maybe put artists in relation to it in ways that are not obviously appropriate or not the logical thing, that, that not to try and sort of get the two uh, areas to cancel each other out. Do you see what I mean? Does that make any sense? That makes a lot of sense. And you know, at this fair, I'm, I'm totally running into the James Welling and several other images of the glass house. I mean, artists make images of the glass house, but that's very literal. In actual fact, the kind of, in, uh, the, the kind of relationship to the glass house you people are talking about is just um, <coughs> trying to understand some of the, the roots of what it is, the process, the artistic process that your artistic process intersects with. Am I correct about that? For instance, Liam, you wrote this music, um, mm -hmm. which we were going to play, but I guess... No, no, it got played a bit at the beginning. We did, it did get yeah, played, we were, okay. Uh, so you wrote this, this music, so in way, what way did that intersect <laughs> with the gra glass house, or what was the role of the glass house in that music? Well, the, the music that was playing, that some people might have heard, uh, was for a film called Points on the Line that was made by Sarah Morris, and uh, um, it's an, it, the, the, my approach to the music exactly uh, re is connected to what I was talking about, that in this case, I looked back at plans again, but not of Johnson, but of things that somehow came out of that. And I grew up with the sort of, the legacy, you know, with the, the reality of the, of the sort of healthcare center that was somehow influenced by the international style or certain later developments. And so on, I looked away from the house and out to these things. And I also thought hard about the, the structure of the house and, and not so much about the details, funnily enough. <coughs> and I, what I tried to do is come up with a, an approach to the music that would, um, it's more connected to the production of ideas than the consumption of ideas. That I tried to put myself in the, in the position where I was thinking more about how does this thing come into being in the first place rather than, you know, how do we view it as a commodity or protect it or Admire or it, or as a or fetish object. Yeah, I tried to sort of bring it to life in real time, but knowing that that would always be a limited process, that you couldn't really do it. So in fact, for me, it's perfect because the music is incomplete. The music is essentially endless, and um, that was my approach. You know, I'm interested in talking about um, Johnson as a collector as well. I'm sure there's, there are many collectors in the audience. And, and because he was an artist himself, an architect, artist, I don't know if you, you know, there, there are people who would many fight with that. people have a lot to say about those two, right. two distinctions. Right. But he seemed to be, at least on the campus of the Glass House, to be in competition with the art in a certain way, to want to control it. We're talking about the Judd, but also your photographs of the sculpture gallery, where he has, um, where the light comes in in strips, which mm. totally alter the sculpture. And at, at various times of the day, it's kind of like a, a fight to the finish. Um, well, the, the, the dramatic pictures you see of the, the sculpture galleries of the light coming through, that was just the kismet of my having been there on a certain glorious day at a certain perfect moment. But I've been there on other days where it goes completely dead and lifeless with a gray sky. You know, so it has this incredible, you know, malleable possibility of seeing something new in it every time. And the architecture in, in that sense becomes it does overpower it. You know, the, the sculptures, you know, by Robert Morris or Bruce Nauman or Michael Heiser, you know, somewhat, somehow get reduced to these, like, twee objects in this space that I guess was uh, inspired by his Mykonos uh, trip he took once to evoke that architecture. 
And yet in the, in the... And then in the painting bunker, you know, it's literally a bunker that's cut into the hill and it has this very uh, strange kind of... I guess it's based on a temple of... Uh, does someone know the name of it? Uh, Hunter, what was the name of the... <laughs> an educated person. <laughs> what was it? We can't hear you. Oh, okay. <laughs> I didn't hear Atreus. Right, Atreus. Anyway, <laughs> it, it has this ceremonial feeling when you enter it. It has this, well, you saw the photograph of it. It's that pyramid-shaped uh, entrance, and when you walk in, you, it's, you're, you're in this kind of womb-like condition. There's a, there's a little corridor, a rectilinear corridor, and then you're in this sort of clover-shaped uh, carousel thing, and it, it, it has this like World's Fair aspect about it. And yet there's um, an aspect of land art, too, right? He had an inspiration from land art. You can actually see the top of the building that's sculpted into the hill. So it has a very interesting land art component that was very clearly self-conscious. But there seems to be a division between how he presented the art on the campus, and then he gave a lot of it away to the MoMA. Mm. You know, he, he steered the MoMA in directions it didn't want to go. David Whitney um, produced the first portfolio of Warhol and in fact, what's very interesting is to see what's left, left, left over in the painting galleries. And there are, there are a number of David Sallies, a number of Schnabels, a number of uh, Frank Stellas that apparently were unwanted by the Museum of Modern Art. So it, 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 that, the that says something. Yeah, the rejects say something about something, you know. Art historically. Well, the, I don't think the MoMA owns a, P a Schnabel, <laughs> does it? I don't think. I, or I, official. I've heard they don't own a, a Jeff Koons either. There you are. Either did John Johnson, however. Or, no, they don't own a, a, any of the Koons celebration pieces. I know that. I know they have a vacuum cleaner piece. They have something Elaine Danheiser yeah, yeah. collected Koons, and they do have yeah. that. Yeah. Um, and we, we, we're going to uh, go to questions in a little while, but, but, but a very important aspect, I mean, we've, kept, we've talked about the architecture and the art, and we've also talked about the relationship between, well, the artists and this space, but also between the two men. And I, I know relationships are almost as important to you, Todd, as they are, as are a, a new way of looking at architecture in in your book I was really struck by their their two images he, he's, he pairs images all the way through the book and I understand it took you a long time to do that curatorial it was, thing uh, it was like going on a treasure hunt in my 30-year archive and he has two that are related to his grandmother maybe quickly before we get to Johnson you could talk about the two that are related to your grandmother well there was a there's a spread in the book that juxtaposes a, a uh, the library in my grandmother's house in Cleveland, Ohio, and, and she was very uh, able and uh, self-inventive self in a Martha Stewart-like way much earlier, and uh, made this slip cover for her sofa out of this Brunswick and Brunswick and Phil's, Phil's is it called? It was Fee. a fabric maker, yeah. Fee. It was a beautiful grid, gridded uh, pattern on linen, and I became obsessed with that when I was three or four years old. And there's a picture of that, and then opposite that is a ceiling of the Frank Lloyd Wright Unity Temple from 1908 that has an almost eerie parallel with the grid in that. And so this became the thing that prescribed the way I see the world, this sofa, when I was very young. and. Um, Dave Hickey, who wrote the essay in the book, wrote a very kind of uh, beautiful passage about the relationship between those two images and says, Grandma Swanson own, uh, holds her own against Frank Lloyd Wright. That's great. But I mean, oh, and actually, just to digress because- I don't know, did the, I answer your question? Yes, you did. I went somewhere else. You're gonna go somewhere else in a minute, but first I just wanna say that you both have these real childhood connections to the mm. glass house, which I'm sure people in the audience do. I think we all do in our to way. Me, I remember hearing over- it was the Jetsons over. that came to life in a way. The Jetsons, yeah. It was the future that actually did arrive. And, and, and for instance, um, Philip Johnson really introduced the, the international style to America in the international style exhibition he put on at the, at the MoMA in 1932. And you own the book, had, did yeah, since but, childhood. Yeah, but the thing, the thing there were two <coughs> books I had as, as a teenager that were before I thought about art that much. And one was the international style book, but the reprint. And it was very cheap, I remember. And I think 
initially I bought it because it was the cheapest book you could find on, you know, that seemed of the time on international modernism, and of course, and Lucy Lippard's pop-up book, which was also extremely cheap. And by mistake, by accident, these are two extraordinary kind of handbooks in their own way. So of course, I'd also seen Johnson as part of deep history. So if you if you're like. 13 in, in, in the early 70s in, in Britain looking at the reprint of the international style with, of hit by Hitchcock and, and Johnson, I'd assumed this guy had died a long time ago and that this person was something, had nothing to do with, with anything uh, that, 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 that could still be seen. And so when I first moved to New York, I'd occasionally go to the Four Seasons bar and I could just about afford a, you know one drink and string it out. And um, just to, just to see him space. sit there because he'd go and sit there sometimes. Oh, did and you I actually see Mr. Johnson yes, sitting Yes, and there? I found this extremely interesting. And he's such a, you know, we, it, you know, he's a complicated person who in a zealot-like way is often in the right place and he's often in very much the wrong place mm. politically and historically. And I found this extremely interesting because it's kind of the, 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 the stories of the 20th century that are uh, too simple often don't account for enough. You see what I mean? Like, and I, I, I was always drawn to him really through politics and through complexity as much as through the purity or the finding another way or another vision somehow. Well, so what Liam is, um, did I put this on right? Can you hear me? What yeah. Liam's referring to, of course, is um, Philip Johnson's flirtation with anti-Semitism and Nazism. But the complexity really brings me to the other part of my question, which was, so you f uh, photographed both Philip and David all, uh, many times, including the no, very- only the one time. Oh, only the last portrait? The two of them together, that was part of, uh, I think you've seen that picture of David and mm -hmm. Philip sitting at the table, no? Yeah. Yeah. That, and, that, and then came, that came immediately after <laughs> what uh, portfolio I did for Vanity Fair that I proposed to Graydon Carter. It was a celebration of the last of the, the living modernists. And basically, they were all around except for Mies and uh, Corbusier. And Philip ended up being the opening spread of that story in which uh, Florence Knoll Bassett appears, um, Ezra Stoller, Julia Shulman, Phyllis Lambert, Dan Kiley, Dieter Rams, the Vignellis. Oscar Niemeyer, and the extraordinary thing about this portfolio is the combined age of the subjects was over 1,000 years. <laughs> and um, and, and, it, and it, 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 it became Philip's last portrait, and I kind of had a sense that he wasn't gonna stick around very long, but I, I convinced David, who had just taken him, Philip out on a walk around the property on his daily routine, um, there was a game of solitaire that David was playing at the table. You see the cards on the table. And I thought, well, it's very odd for Philip to be sitting there on the other side of it, almost catatonic in the, in the portrait I took. And then when I convinced David, it, with much resistance, he, he really didn't want to do the picture with Philip because he had, had they, someone had taken a portrait of them that he didn't like. And he thought, and I said, well, you know, I'm a different photographer. So he went along with it. But what's interesting is Philip became very animated in that picture, and David looks like he's near death. So in a way, it's strange how the, 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 the dynamic switched. But I'm very happy that I got to take that portrait, because uh, it, except for that black and white one, I think it's the only one of the two of them together, and, and that has no context, the, the other one. And what about the, the portrait with a dog? Oh, the portrait with the dog was uh, a commission from House and Garden, and uh, I went out there. It was a Saturday morning, and Philip, this was, I think, four or five years. So it was probably 2000 or so. And Philip had these Keyshawn hound dogs that really ran around the property quite actively. And I asked Philip to uh, hold one of the dogs because he's, it, it doesn't really look like a dog house. So I thought if you had the dog, it would suggest this dog house thing. And I remember he was very frail and, and barely, like the dog, he could barely even manage to sort of keep in his arms. But there's something very sweet about it. It's like he's hugging a big teddy bear. Yeah. Well, you I'm, know, and the, the one last... Time, yeah, time signals from... Oh, okay. Time signals from oh, the over, back okay. of the room. Okay. We're time to go <coughs> to... Um, it's time to go to questions, and I have to say that the lights are in our eyes, and um, 
we're going to have to have probably other people point out who's asking a question. But we're, I'm sure that somebody has a question um, for, yes, there's a hand up over there. So I'm betting. They're going to bring you um, a microphone. No? Okay, th was there a hand up? Yes, right here in the front row. Hi, sorry. Oh. Oh. Um, oh, Sarah Margolis, Detroit. I am just wondering, um, I think something that I find very compelling about the Glass House and something that distinguishes it from example, um, other <coughs> mid-century modern sites like the Farnsworth House is that uh, through the development of his programming, it's really put discourse at the center of its activities. And um, I'm just curious, Liam, how you feel, uh, how, do, how do these sites sort of articulate and contemporize and re-examine um, issues or conversations surrounding uh, modernity, just modern with capital mm -hmm. Well, I mean, I think I covered a little bit of it earlier on, but it's clear that you can read the entire, I like that you called it a campus. I never thought of doing that. I think I that's thought what they about, call it. Yeah, but I thought about trying to write a, a text once about the campusization of, of like, corporate life and, and every type of experimental form. And um, I think that, that what happens is that, that there's a dilemma, that, that there's the idea that one should focus on, as we said, the details and look clearly and do some thorough and responsible sort of modernist excavation. But on the other hand, it's got this, this uh, very much a prototypical quality that points towards certain models of, of, of art and new forms of curating, for example, um, that tended to develop, I'd say, in the last 20 years, where the role of the artist as such is not necessarily, or the art object is not always in a stable and pure relationship to the surroundings, for example. So a good example of this, even the difference between, say, me and John Baldessari on this would be, uh, John Baldessari is clearly a very extraordinary, uh, uh, complex, uh, self-conscious, playful artist. But when it comes to the question of architecture and the deployment of art, he'll often in a jokey way say, I think museums should ask architects to do the craziest things they feel like and then build a shed next door for the artists. <laughs> do you see what I mean? And, and the issue that I find fascinating about, and why it's really worth visiting the glass house, for example, is to s you see kind of traces of the future that can't just be talked about in terms of architecture. They also have to be talked about in terms of a new, another way of seeing things. So on, on one hand, I think you see something good in that. You see a transition point. You see a certain transition. And of course, in, at the same time, you see kind of warnings or, or dangers or, or collapses. But it's not pure. It's not purest. And I'm, you know, to a certain extent, um, you know, I've had, I've had, I've had situations of um, having to listen to people argue about Mies van der Rohe and Johnson, <coughs> and sat in between. And somehow I think it's not the point. For me, it's not the issue of the relationship between the two. For me, it's not as interesting as their their implications for art. Johnson is extremely useful for new structural models of the deployment of art. Mies van der Rohe is not, and that's just the way it is. There's nothing you can do about it. It's just one of those things, and I find that really fascinating. It's kind of who they were in many ways, too. Yeah, yeah. but it's not, that's not a question of quality, and it's not a question of who is the better architect. You see what I mean? Yes. So um, I find the, there's this unresolved quality that I find really fascinating. Yes, you um, can. <coughs> Sorry, my name is Francesca von Habsburg. Um, I had a question that I've never been there, but I looked at the images of the collection and it seems to me to be slightly random. And other than MoMA rejects, like the Schnabels and the, the um, Sallies that you s we saw, I didn't understand how this collection is curated or how it developed, who chose those works. And I, th I think following to a, that, to a great just let me extent, finish the, the question that Liam brought up about you know inviting artists to continue this kind of intervention and, and re not necessarily only reflecting the house itself, but the whole property. Because the outdoor pieces seem to be very site specific, whereas the artworks inside the museum seem random to me, so I don't know how this worked out. 
Well, it's also not really a museum, and I think David Whitney had a lot to do with uh, bringing, you know, his, his, his age difference with Philip, he was much closer, you know, to people like David Sally and, and Julian Schnabel and, and brought, as far as I understand, brought them in and really was an early supporter of, of their work. And there are also some, some Cindy Shermans. Are, are we seen those? I haven't really looked at the show. I don't show, know if we've seen them, but... There yeah. are a couple Cindy Shermans in the collection. Um, you know, so it does have this almost random thing, but what, uh, one of the most striking pictures in it, and I'm not sure if it's in the show, is Andy Warhol did a portrait of Philip Yes, it's in there. That's, yeah, you the, know, the, one the, of the, the, it's a very unusual portrait yeah. for Andy because it has multicolored, a multicolored repetition in it, which is in much more kind of in depth because I think it, you know, Andy was a was a big, uh, was a frequent guest at the Saturday or Sunday lunches that were, you know, pretty much every week at the Glass House and. Um, and that that when you when you walk into the gallery, it's not not a museum of, of any sort. It's really it has this personal feel, like that's where they would go to look at the paintings, and they'd flip the walls around and look at what they wanted to look at. So you know, it doesn't really have this. Uh, it has this intimacy that's surprising about it. Well, it feels I personal. Can I, yeah. can I just yeah. seeing as we're probably recording this. I just want to step in and sort of slightly defend David Sally's honor for a second, because we don't actually know that these things were rejected as such. Right. And speaking as an artist, I'm aware that all sorts of crackpot ideas come up with the, of what to do with artwork. And maybe the artist said, I, this is not a, interesting or not appropriate. Maybe the ownership of the work was in question. We don't really know. So I just want to make sure that we're not thinking that. No, I think it's, it's, a, it's just an interesting <laughs> hypothetical situation. But I think exactly. We, but I, but I, I know what you mean as well. It's totally but that, hypothetical. But it's true. We don't that know. It's true a little bit that what we were talking about, this thing of like, what is this place? What does it really represent? It's true that there's a tendency to cherry pick certain things and ignore certain other things. And, and for me, you don't cherry pick this kind of situation. You have to look at it in context, its own context at least, if not the broader context of, of, of the area of America it's in, which is also full of a certain forms of more generic modernism. And, and, and it's an extraordinary kind of, as an area of the world, parts of it are an extraordinary marker of a certain form of aspiration and openness at the same time. A sort of the bourgeoisie sort of exposing itself in a way to mm -hmm to scrutiny, but under certain codes of, of modernism that was supposed to be more universal. And that's an extraordinary thing to, to behold. And it kind of disappears. It, it disappeared behind gates very quickly, you know, or behind certain communities, you know? I don't understand. Yep. It disappeared into gated communities. Right. That well, kind in of fact, the, the, the site is a gated community. Yes. There was an we urgent have question there, from yes. here. I'm sorry, I'm That's going to interrupt for a moment. Good, because I'm this is Rena Zorowski who can explain the interim director yeah, who can we, explain what happened. We, we from the Glasshouse staff feel we need to explain about the art collection. Um, David Whitney and Philip Johnson gave over 2,200 works of art to the Museum of Modern Art. They weren't always works that MoMA wanted. They were often ahead of MoMA's time. So uh, what was left, uh, Philip Johnson died in 2005. David Whitney, although he's 33 years younger, died only six months later somewhat, not entirely suddenly, but somewhat suddenly. Um, they had been tr deciding what pieces to keep in the collection once the National Trust took over the property. And I think to some extent there are some random things there, and it was about time and, uh, and who was popular at the time or just who was left as they were figuring things out. But it wasn't necessarily that they were MoMA rejects. And uh, sorry, some of them were some of the best pieces in the collection, and some of them were not. Well, 2,200 so, plus works, that's an extraordinary, extraordinarily small number of leftovers. It has a feeling of leftoverness somehow. <laughs> You're not talking into. I mean, because you don't Sorry. see you don't see Jasper John's flag hanging on those carousels. No, you know. Jasper John's flag in particular, Alfred Barr had asked Johnson to buy so that when the MoMA board was ready to accept it, um, they would take it. But I'm going to go <laughs> to the question. I'm, I'm told there's no time, Stephen Evans. Um, I can add a little bit of texture to the Donald Judd. It's placed oh, in good. response to the topography of the site. It is. Um, 
the angles are in response to a hill that it's to placed on. To the grade on. of the land, right? Yeah, to the, to the grade. And I understand the conflict came over the, um, the actual pouring of the concrete, and there's a huge crack in it still that I know a lot of conservators have looked at. And that was the beginning of an argument. And then I believe that Philip or David planted flowers inside <laughs> as a response <laughs> to uh, the sharp. Oh, that <laughs> was their revenge. Which is very funny. And yeah. then, Liam, I just wanted to say I was struck by you going to the Four Seasons because when you said you turned your back on the glass house, I almost pictured you inside the glass house looking yeah, exactly. out and sort of placing yourself in Zelig's shoes. So. That's yeah, lovely. That That's a sense. wonderful way to end. Thank you all for coming. Okay.